food over the next two years in many parts of the world is going to come into short supply and energy prices are bound to rise significantly higher uh, as by the end of this year or early next year we will see a repeat of the Glesenberg cycle when one of these shocks arise it's going to hit equity markets and base metal prices very hard. Expect the correction, prepare for the correction by the middle of the year, rolling recessions until the early 2030s. You can forget about rising metal prices, even rising energy prices. It's the early stages of gold coming back into the monetary system. One word, disaster. All right, Simon, you and I spoke about, I want to call it six months ago, something among those lines. The video's actually done really well. It was seen by, by almost 50,000 people, uh, over 1,100 likes. It's got nearly 400 comments. So I'm happy to see you, but the, the YouTube algorithm is also going to be happy to see you. Um, but those 50,000 people got to hear from you that by April of 2024, which is about two weeks ago now, uh, we were going to be in a recession in combination with a nasty crash in, in stocks and commodities, including oil and copper. Um, since then, though, the GDP, GDP has the U.S. GDP has been uh, go well, still stayed remained stable. Basically, it's over two percent each quarter. The S and P is up over twenty percent. Uh, so is oil and copper too. By the way, all, all up some twenty percent or so. While inflation has stayed in the three percent range and unemployment has stayed below four percent for that time, none of which looks like a crash to me what um how do you reconcile all of that what what went wrong well nothing's gone wrong hmm. um matters have been postponed um uh, if you look at us gdp gdp itself showed a growth of 2.5 percent last year but gross domestic investment, which normally mirrors GDP, only grew by 0.5%. Um, and even that number was bolstered by an increase of 4.8% in the fourth quarter. Some analysts have reservations that 4.8% <coughs> excuse me, was too high. You look at the small business survey, that was unbelievably bearish on every front, um, including there was one question, what is your cost of money? It was, I can't remember the exact figure, but it was around 9%. Small businesses are paying 9% for credit. Then if you look at the employment data, um, that's very upside down. If you look at the household survey, which is the one that's never published by the media, it shows a completely different story to the establishment survey. But what both reveal is that virtually all of the increase comes from uh, um, part-time jobs part-time jobs pay much less. On the inflation front, it's very interesting that Larry Summers, just a few days ago, he and his team took CPI workings back to Bra, Arthur Burns in the 1970s, and came up that CPI real CPI peaked at 18% last year. Now I follow John Williams of um, shadow government statistics, and he's regularly reworked all the employment and uh, CPI numbers back to prior to Arthur Burns. And the average CPI he has for last year is 12%. And actual unemployment is around 25%. So 
So what you're seeing, what you're actually uh, um, experiencing is that a lot of those who could be in the labor force have opted out uh, because of government handouts and probably pursuing uh, part-time jobs outside the official system. So what I'm saying, and it's not just me, uh, Daniel Martina Booth, who was the personal assistant to the president of the Dallas Fed, is regularly saying on Fox News, we are in recession, just that the numbers have not yet shown it. And that's what uh, has been our belief for some time. So <clears throat> the system, because the reported numbers have looked so encouraging, I repeat, reported numbers, and with the fact that the prospect of a war with Russia has encouraged money managers to exit European markets and to reposition their funds into America, and not just from Europe, but from all over the world. The question is, is this, um, is this extremes in valuation justified? And will we see a correction? As I was saying, we'd see one by April. But from what I piece together, we are going to have a shock before June. That shock can come from the internal workings of the financial system. It takes time for other than the low hanging fruit to be impacted by the big increase that we've seen in rates over the last two years. And on historical grounds, that positioning is now coming due any moment now. So shock one will arise from the internal uh, the workings of the financial system. Shock two uh, <clears throat> will come or could come from an escalation of the war in uh, over Europe and over the Middle East. And that is a very real shock which can come at any moment. Uh, what we perceive is that when Russia has proven to 100% that the intelligence agencies of America, the UK, and Kiev were involved in orchestrating the attack, then you will see there will be a very sharp retaliation. What you will also see in the Middle East is Israel's attack on the consulate, on Iran's consulate in Damascus. Um, that retaliation is likely to be coordinated with Russia's retaliation. So you're going to get a double whammy. And the longer that Iran restrains itself from retaliating, and from retaliating, the greater will be the pressure on Israel because they have to remain in a crisis mode until there is an attack, if there will be one. So 
the third um, uh, risk to markets is that actually there is a growing chance that either in April or in June, instead of the Fed cutting rates, they will actually increase them. Inflation is not only being sticky, but it is rising. And it is continuing to rise, especially in food prices. And food over the next two years in many parts of the world is going to come into short supply and energy prices are bound to rise significantly higher. Both of which will not only um, impact uh, uh, inflation rates, but will surely impact physical business. So that's how I answer your question. So not very bullish still, to put it nope. mildly. But nope. uh, but the, I mean, basically, way... basically, basically, when one of these shocks arise, it's going to hit equity markets and base metal prices very hard. Uh, we see the risk of a correction being as much as 30 to 40%. The rise in uh, copper prices has not been due to trade activity, hmm. but to funds, and mostly funds originating from China, because the Chinese funds this is how the game started. The Chinese funds wanted to increase the value of their equity holdings, such as in Jiangxi Copper. And then it's become a momentum play. So you're seeing increasingly new funds in China coming into the game. So what's going to stop that? Well, first of all, a big correction in equity markets will stop it. Secondly, the trade is not participating. And thirdly, there is a risk that over the next month or so that the State Reserve Bureau in China will begin selling uh, some copper. What do you think, I suppose the question then would for me be, how's the market missing all that? Every, pretty much all, everything's up. I mean, I mean, you just explained copper, but oil is up, gold is up, the stocks are up. Well, oil is up for a very good reason, which is that um, the market in, in, in oil is tightening and there is a perception, certainly in this part of the world, that any, any attack on Iran will lead to a closure of the straits. Iran is completely prepared for it. Um, there are, so I'm told from, from my sources, explosives on the bed of the Straits of Hormuz. So it's only going to need the press of a button and you will shut down the straits. Um, traffic, as you know, is being um, is being uh, lessened through the Suez Canal because of what's going on in the Red Sea, and that is unlikely to to stop anytime soon. And the attacks that um, Ukraine has done on Russian oil refineries adjacent to the Ukrainian border is also tightening the market up. Um, people say, oh, that's great. We're hurting Russia that way without thinking. What's it doing to global energy prices? So you add all of these together, um, the oil market 
is pretty delicately balanced to certainly over the next six months to explode higher. And food prices are being impacted already by climate changes. And I don't I don't mean um, climate warming, just just fundamental climate changes. And that's likely to get worse uh, as by the end of this year or early next year, we will see a repeat of the Glesenberg cycle, uh, which happened in the 1930s, causing uh, the Midwest drought that existed for a decade. So, and again, if you look at uh, what households are physically having to pay for items. Uh, there's an outfit called the Chatwood Survey, which surveys twice a year 500 regular items in 50 different towns and cities. The last completed survey was first half of last year. And that showed those 500 items in 50 different towns and cities rising by just over 10%. Comes back to what has been the real inflation level. It's not 3%, it's closer to 10 or 12%. And what does that mean to 80% or so of your households in America. Budgets are very tight. They've spent on credit cards, on rising debt, and now what are they paying on credit cards? Over 20%. So everything is tightening up. And what uh, what um, worries me is that there is a small group, but a very influential one, who are saying we should defend the dollar and allow the treasury market to find its own level. What does that mean by defending the dollar? rates not just staying high but getting higher and what does that do to the rest of the world and why might this happen it's because it fits into the neocons foreign policy we have to retain america's hegemony and dollar's dominance so what better way of doing that than having a strong and strengthening dollar? So if that, if that scenario plays out, and I'm not saying it will, but it's a risk sitting there, then the inflation blow off that I was expecting and probably mentioned in our last chat that would happen from mid this year to mid 2025 won't happen you are you are now seeing that blow off now so i'm i'm watching this very carefully because i'm not sure whether our original scenario will play out or whether this new one will we will only know around the middle of the year so my bottom line is expect the correction, prepare for the correction by the middle of the year. And then we have to reassess whether that is going to be the top in copper and other metal prices, or whether we get the inflation blow off, which will see um, all commodities uh, rising very sharply, but at the same time, inflation soaring, 
global inflation will be over 15% in a year's time. US inflation well over 10%. What does that mean to the bond vigilance? They will hate it. And you will see 10-year treasuries as one example, rising by early 2025 to over 10%. And what does that do to a highly leveraged system? You have the crash. What I'm fearing is, and it's not a forecast yet, is that that crash happens around mid this year, not in mid-2025. The other things you have to look at is central banks want to introduce central bank digital currencies. What does that mean? To introduce them, you've got to shut the banking system down. And how do you shut down the banking system? By getting your intelligence services to do a cyber attack on their own, on their own banking systems. Hmm. Problem then is, does that spill over to the computer systems that run airlines and run electricity grids? Um, so then on top of that, you've got the war scenario, which is bound to escalate. And that in itself is inflationary. Mm. Well, you see that you see that budgets are tightening up. I tell you what's not tightening up. That's uh, lottery spending. Uh, you look at what Americans spent on lottery tickets last year it was 113 billion dollars. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Just... What's that doing? They're trying to find extra income to live on. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that's a, a, a trivial data point or not, but it kind of it seemed worrying to me. Um, although it probably shouldn't, because I typically invest in exploration companies, and that's pretty much the same. Um, Jokes aside, the Fed hasn't started pumping liquidity into the system in the way you expected it either. And the balance sheet has continued reducing uh, global liquidity, kind of staying flat there. And central banks haven't started cutting rates for the most part. When do you think all of that or some of that changes? It only changes when the official data shows that we are in recession. So mid this year. Should be mid this year. Okay. Then so the right. then is going to be what's going to be the reaction of the Fed. As I've said, originally our original scenario was then as soon as that happens, the floodgates of liquidity are opened, interest rates are dropped. But I it depends who gets the upper hand in the policy making within Washington. Is it those that say we support the treasury market and allow the dollar to, to, to fall sharply, or we support the dollar? So though it'll be neocon crowd who will want the dollar to be strengthened. What do you think, yeah. realistically, what's happening? I th realistically, the debate is on. Sure. Who wins so, it? I, 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 I'm not going to try to speculate, say, which one is going to prevail. I think both parties, though, given that it's an election year, wouldn't both parties sort of try to promise tax cuts and just more money to the masses? And, and this, although funny, this lottery spending thing, it, it maybe tells you a little bit more about the mentality of the people and how stressed their personal balance sheets are, as you pointed out. So you come out as a politician, you say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it easy on you um, in simple terms, whatever that might mean. Uh, wouldn't both parties want to do that? Well, I think the bigger question is, will there be an election? How do you mean? Just that. If you have a war before the election... There is an option, apparently, in the Constitution, so I'm told, which has never yet been used, but that wouldn't stop this crowd of using it in, in cancelling an election. 
Okay. Um, I mean, there is a there is there are many of my friends who are saying it's only 50 50 that there will be an election because we will be at war for that long yeah for that long well as long as you have it as long as there is an open war you need not have an election hmm. how long does the war last I don't know well, it's interesting you mentioned wars here because if you look at the uh, deficit spending as a percentage of GDP, sort of in isolation, let's say you don't know what's happening uh, in the world right now. You look at you look at deficit spending as a percentage of GDP. You'd immediately think that the U.S. is at war, and arguably it it well it actually is in a few even. So, is the deficit spending influenced by that fact that there are so many wars now, and and wouldn't it just kind of fix itself once those issues are resolved? I don't think deficit spending has anything to do with it. Okay. I think it's the war is a political game. But, but typically, deficit spending goes up during war times. The deficit spending goes up in wartime. Yes, for sure. Hmm. What's... And, and in theory, that should mean a weakening dollar, but that depends on American policy. Yeah, it comes back to that debate that I say is is going on at the moment. Don't know the outcome. It also, I suppose, depends on what other central banks are doing, and and none of the major central banks have blinked yet. Well, the ECB hasn't blinked yet, which I suppose is also an important part in determining the value of the dollar. Um, but humor me, right? But paint me a picture here. What what happens if? Deficit spending, debt levels keep going up. Uh, migration, which is something I want to talk about as well. Migration stays at the current levels. And we actually have that recession, that crash that you mentioned. What does the world look like then? Like, how should I imagine that? The, the odds are that we will have at best rolling recessions until the early 2030s. The greater probability is that the whole debt issue um, implodes and we have a depression which will last until the early 2030s. So you can forget about rising metal prices even rising energy prices. Um, there will be food shortages. Unemployment will soar. I mean, all the obvious things. Mm. A really tough, tough period. How do we come out of it, though? Uh, you see, until the 2030 seems like a long period. I, I, what yeah, I think we come out of it because um, after internal strife within countries and after a war between countries, somebody with common sense will emerge in America to lead the country not as not as an aggressive policy to other nations, but to one where let's work together. I mean, if, for instance, and this is not a forecast, Bobby Kennedy happened to get into the White House, which I think is a 20% chance, but if he did, you would see a different world evolve because he understands the problems. He's got a good brain. He's got a scientific background. Um, then I think we have a chance of, um, of coming out of it much earlier. Hmm. But again, it comes back to the fundamental question, will there be an election? 
these guys in power are going to do everything they can to see that they remain in power. Doesn't matter what. Well, yeah, I understand that there's a possibility for there not being an election, but that there's not much historic data or anything to go off there to gig the probability thereof. What do you, what's your good feeling telling you? What's the probability of there actually not being an election? I said 20% chance. You said 20% chance that Bobby go well, gets into well, Oh, I'd say 50-50. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's aggressive. I mean, that's a high... high I, I have one informed friend doesn't often get things wrong. He said 70-30. Okay. So it's a... I think it's a big chance. Okay. He also said... These guys will do anything to remain in office and everything that they are doing now is building the foundations for a war. They are just trying to, to push Russia into making the first move. I think Russia, China and Iran are astute enough um, not to be not to be drawn into making the first move they will create something that forces nato to make the first move hmm. how could um it, it might be might sound kind of silly when you when you say something like oh we might be going into war no recession and all these very uh dire predictions if you will um, so it might sound funny to ask a question like this, but I'm, I'm I'm trying to think about sort of the more positive side of the story and how the U.S. economy could eventually get on a better fiscal path here. W what's the main or the main couple of solutions or things that a new president would have to do to get the U.S. on a better fiscal path? He has to cut his spending, doesn't he? Is that the it's best like, thing to like do? Like you and the... I, if the bank comes down on you and says no more overdraft, it's the same for the government. The day will come when they have nasty decisions they have to take. Well, so that gets you on a fiscal path, on a better fiscal path, sure. Yeah, but, but, it, I... but, it, but it, 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 it will create tough times for everybody for two or three years. But that's what a real leader of a country has to take. Hmm. We don't have a real lever. And then what? Go back to ZERP, back to aggressive QE and other forms of softening? Um... No, you, you go back to uh, an economy or a world economy that is not dependent upon debt for its growth. Hmm. And if you look at the level of debt now in relationship to GDP, I've forgotten the exact number, it's something like three to one. And in order to get 1% of growth, you are having to spend so much more in debt. Hmm. Can't go on. I think debt to GDP is uh, the U.S. is now in the top ten countries of debt to GDP. Um, I think they're a little bit better than Italy, which is not very um, promising, is it? But it's still it's at around one hundred and thirty percent or something like that. I think, and and I suppose a lot of the politicians or whatever's happening, uh, maybe for the one tenth of everything that I understand, they're trying to balance everything um, and 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 sort of come out the other way with a, with a win win, if you will. Um, and I suppose that's what they're trying to do with migration, isn't it? I said I wanted to talk about this, but where, where does migration come into play in your analysis of, of the Western world right now? One word, disaster. Okay. Well, look at New York now. I mean, my, my friends who know New York well won't go there. It's a dangerous place. It's a dangerous place because you've got illegal immigrants that are being housed in schools and hotels. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. And 
a lot of the immigrants come from criminal gangs, whether in, in, from anywhere in South America. That's not exactly where I want to go, but I, I, I see your point there. I don't have that exact data or, um, to talk about that specifically. What I'm thinking but about is how... It's the same in Europe. Sure. And you know, I'm thinking how... In Sweden. Sweden was a wonderful, lovely place to visit. Everybody was safe. Now? Hmm. How long can this go on for realistically? Sort of importing where I was going with this was importing labor, if you will. And so growing the labor supply domestically while debt levels are also growing. How long could this go on for? And is that what the Fed is doing? Because where I'm coming from with this, the Fed has so far typically tried fighting inflation in a couple of ways, allegedly, one of which was by slowing down wage growth and, and job growth, right? So with the current job growth numbers, I'm thinking, wouldn't that mean that the Fed simply keeps its course of higher for longer especially in combination with migration and importing labor. But then it comes back to what are the real numbers? Which numbers are the Fed looking at? Mm. I mean, historically, their models have always been wrong. And I just come back to the real numbers. Just look at the household survey, which the media never focuses on because the establishment survey always shows you the optimistic picture. Hmm. And, and again, uh, since the start of the year, announced firings by companies are 250,000. They're not appearing yet in the, in the numbers, partly because most of those firings, they have severance pays. Hmm. But it's real. More people equals more demand for goods and services, though. Um, I mean, it, wouldn't that show up in the real numbers? Sorry, say it again. More people equals more demand for both goods and services. So importing labor, um, it, it, you're importing demand for goods and services, who, too. How How is it being financed? They're so far. That, the, most of them are not contributing to GDP. Most of them are living on government subsidies and handouts. I mean, the, the data from New York is just terrifying. Free schooling, free, free living, free food, credit cards with, with cash balances on them. Who pays for it? It's the government. This is also where we get into what we were previously talking about debt to GDP and, and yeah. deficit spending yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, but uh, I still have a hard time imagining a, a recession or a meltdown while deficit spending is, is as aggressive. Basically, how do you reconcile that? Some sectors of the economy are benefiting. The consumer, the average consumer is not. Small businesses, which are over 60% of GDP, are not. It's a two halves economy. Problem is, I've not done the numbers, but if you're talking about the consumers, which is over 60% of the economy, then that is the bigger issue. 80% of households are finding it very tough to meet daily expenses. Which is why when you take retail sales and even deflate them by the official CPI, they're negative. But then if you deflate them by what's really going on at the household level, they're extremely weak. How do you what, what what would it take for you to be to be wrong basically? Like what do you think has to change for you to turn bullish on all of these things that you just told me you're bearish on and and by mid-year, let's say we do another interview in a couple of months and you say, you know what, 
changed my mind. I think it's all good now. What would that look like? <laughs> no war. Sensible policies in Washington. Cut a lot of these uh, handouts to consumers. He was going to have to cut the, you know, the big things, military spending, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I don't see those things happening with this current government, yeah. nor do I see it happening across Europe. Do you see it happening if the government changes to the other color? What in Europe? No, um, I, well, U Europe US. is it? US, yeah. No, I, I, I don't think so. Okay. I think, I think, I think Trump is basically going to. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know, but I, my guess would be, he would be party to. We have a strong US dollar. And the rest of the world can go to hell. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make America great again. I think what this looks like, so what we are talking about here, and and although I'm trying to maybe play a little bit of a devil's advocate here to to understand what you're, doing, you're you know, doing, good job. <laughs> what, what's going on in your head? Um, because there's there's less than one tenth of that in my head, is that like this either feels like the best soft landing ever, like the the most well engineered soft landing ever, or this is just going to come out with a slow with a slowdown. And it's going to be bigger than anything we've ever seen, um, and and to me it's almost like a coin flip at this point. Because again, looking at the the, the data tells you one thing, and then you look at um, what people like you are telling me, it's pretty much the complete opposite. Well, I think that's people, I mean, historically, people always want to look on the good side. Mm. And you've got a number of investment banks, without naming them, who support the Democrats. They want to see a soft landing. They don't want to see a big correction. But if you get a shock to the system, and there are a number that can that can come, then they're blown out of the water. Yeah. I also think maybe this just looks different. This time it's different, right? The most dangerous words. But there was there was a, a pre-stimulation of the economy, if you will, with a lot of money. Money supply went up double. I mean, what did it do? Like it went up by 50% or something like that, didn't double. Went up by like 40 or 50% in a very brief period of time. And that just hasn't happened before. So why would you expect the recession to look like anything before because, that? Because if you look at the data, that extra issuance of credit has been worked off. Hmm. We have a very, I can't show it, but we have a very interesting chart that just shows that. So you you that surplus credit is being worked off. Yeah. Yeah. And and when I ask you what would it take for you to turn bullish, you started by saying, you know, sensible policy in Washington, and that's kind of where you lost me already. But um I lost myself. <laughs> what's the what's the probability of that? Like how what do you give it a ten percent probability or not even that? Not even that. The current mm. government, not that. Mm. Okay. I think I think this government is hell bent. We are going to have a war, and if we can, we will have the war before the election. Well, what's that really mean? Um, in this case, I mean, war. I mean, so a, I mean, an actual war, not a proxy war. Fought in the U.S. or like what? what what's what? What's that look like? What it looks like is you will have 
officially troops on the ground in Ukraine. Through, well, uh, I'm way out of my depth, but NATO's there right now. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're there in proxy form. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia knows they're there. Russia has been killing them. I mean, um, soon after the attack on the concert hall in Moscow, they destroyed... Uh, with a, a Zircon missile, a, a command and control bunker, which killed all of the NATO officers, including a senior Polish brigadier general. Mm. You way out of my depth here, so uh, I, I kind of prefer to pivot out of that conversation uh, before I say even more silly things than than I typically do, but. There's Lynn Alden. I don't know if you're aware of her work. Um, I hope you are. Very good work. Um, and she she tweeted something a couple of days ago that kind of stuck with me. And she said that almost all of investing and in, in, in finance can be summed up as shorting abundant things and going long scarce things, which is which it kind of made me think about. I I knew that we were going to be doing this interview, and it kind of made me think about your take on commodities, your your bearish take on commodities here, because. As far as I understand well, it, it was, a commodity it was <laughs> the original one was short term bearish, uh, twelve to eighteen months, extremely bullish, and then very bearish. Now I'm just not sure whether we're going to get that twelve to eighteen months of real bullishness. Comes back as I said to who wins the debate in 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 Washington? Do we? Um, allow the bond market to fall or do we allow or make sure that the dollar remains the strongest currency in the world mm. that's the real question right that the, the currency thing is obviously interesting here um to talk about given how much debt there is denominated in u.s dollars outside of the u.s and that eventually is going to have to come well not eventually that will just heat have to keep coming back and especially fighting these wars, financing them in US dollars still keeps coming back, I suppose. But the point for me was more like, um, you know, you short abundant things, you long scarce things. Commodities from pretty much all perspectives um, and not irrespective of demand growth, but almost irrespective of demand growth for some of them, specifically, for example, uranium, which is very, knows a very inelastic demand. There's just Supply is just very challenged in in in, in every way. Red tape, um, the availability of skilled labor, the availability of of materials and sulfuric acid and whatnot. So so how do you, how do you reconcile overall bullishness on commodities when they're in short supply? That's what I was I was going after. Well, well, first of all, which commodity are you talking about? Because they're they're not all the same. So if you're talking about copper. We had a big surplus in copper last year. There are very severe um, uh, supply problems with concentrates. Mm -hmm. But which is the bigger problem? The slow growth in consumption or the falling smelt production? Um, I've just actually done an analysis of this, uh, recognizing that there are not enough concentrates in the world this year to fill all smelters with their normal rates of production. The first question is, to what extent will... Chinese smelters pay whatever they have to pay for concentrates, thus putting the pressure on the rest of the world's concentrate uh, smelters. So actually, the conclusion that, that I've come to is that there will be, instead of 
smelt production increasing by four to 600,000 tons in China this year, it increases by only 200. Hmm. But even that increase of 200 puts enormous pressure on smelters outside, um, get my crib sheet, outside China. And you will get an approximate um, reduction in primary smelt production um, of around 1 million tons this year in the world, excluding China. So then when you look at the supply side, you'll have an increase in, in uh, secondary production. And with only a 3% increase in global refined consumption, you'll have a deficit of something like 350,000 tons compared to an increase last year of around 500,000 tons in round numbers. But if you increased, you said that actually you're being too pessimistic, Simon, on consumption, and that it increased by 4% this year. So that brings you up to a, a cathode deficit of around 900,000 tons. So then you have to say, what is consumption going to be? It comes back to my original point, which is the debate in Washington, whether we save the dollar or we save the treasury market. Because if you're going to save the dollar, it's going to put huge pressures on global growth mm. outside China. I think there's few people and countries that are looking to save the dollar. And that's something we can talk about as well within, um, within the context of central banks uh, buying gold in a second. What I do want to touch upon, though, regarding copper is that, that long term, as far as I understand it, long term, what matters is how much copper comes out of the ground versus how much copper we consume. So let's look at it. Let look at it by the end of the 2030s or whatever. We are coming short copper. However, short term, what matters more is sort of the right place, right time. If you have upheavals in political upheavals in Peru that you know prohibit ships from leaving, or you have troubles in the Red Sea where ships cannot get to China on time, it. Maybe there's not a lot of or not no growing copper demand in China, but there is a continued demand of a certain level. But if you have the cotton, so maybe you have even too much copper. But if that too much copper is at the southern tip of Africa in a ship and you need it to be in China by yesterday, there can still be and there will likely still be fluctuations in the price even over the short run. Is that not true? Yeah, sure. sure. How, how how do you deal with that in the context of, again, the war and everything else that's going on? Because it just seems that transporting is a big issue here that should be taken into account. Well, uh, first of all, there is a large unreported stock of cathode shifted out of the reporting system into the unreporting system, particularly in Europe. Um, you've had the same in China. People have been talking about how tight the copper market is in China. It has been tight, but who's been holding it? It's been certain SOEs who have um, who ship a lot of copper out of Africa into China. That some of that copper is now being released given the increase in prices. And you've seen a big increase in um, Shanghai stocks and in bonded warehouse stocks. As I said before, there's a risk that the State Reserve Bureau will sell some copper this year. So 
from China's point of view, they have reserves of physical copper that if there are um, logistical problems from wherever, they also have a second source of supply, which is Russia, because Russia and China have agreed that any surplus cathode that is built up in Russia because they can't, or countries won't accept that cathode, is essentially one way or another a cathode stock for China. So China is. is well supplied. Hmm. The question is, if you have more logistical problems out of Africa, but at the same time, Europe has a surplus of cathode inventory held outside the reporting system. So you look at it today, why is the contango at a high level of $140? It's telling you that, and it's been that way all this year, around 140, between 100 and $140. What it's actually telling you is that the immediate requirements for physical copper are quite, are quite easy. It's not telling us it's a tight market. So you, you're not seeing $5 copper by the end of the year? I'd be very, very surprised if we did. But it would also tell me that the blow-off in copper and other metal prices is now not in mid-2025. Hmm. A lot of the things that I thought were true in 2021 have appeared not to be exactly exactly true. When I say thought, a lot of things that I was told were true. Um, for example, the, the the correlation between gold and and interest rates. You 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 look at it right now, and they've been positively correlated. Right, gold gold's hitting all time highs pretty much every session over the last what ten trading sessions or something like that. What's I mean? Yeah, what, what is the gold price telling you? It's not telling you you've got a stable world. It's telling you you've got a very violent world. Who are the big buyers? They're big, either they're central banks or they're large old families. Um, why is... Uh, gold is such a big premium to London and New York in Singapore and Shanghai. Gold has been moving from west to east. And what is China going to do? I think very soon, within two years, and it can be within, could even be before the end of this year, I don't know. But the day will come when China will actually announce our currency is supported by the gold which our citizens hold. Mm. And if you look at how much has been bought from the Shanghai Gold Exchange since it was formed in 2002, it's around 23,000 tons. That is the gold that China's citizens and financial institutions hold. And in, I think it was two or three months ago, the PBOC set up a system whereby households can use their bank accounts to directly buy physical gold from the Shanghai Gold Exchange and can do it on an installment basis. Then if you look at the videos of households 
going into gold jewelry shops. The lines of queues are very long. And there's even a new one, which is a gram of gold is in a little nugget. And that is being produced and sold aggressively. Still, though, that that doesn't necessarily explain the the positive correlation with U.S. interest rates here. And I'm thinking if 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 and how you would explain that. And one of those explanations, I found an explanation somewhere online. I don't remember who said it, but someone said that it could be because of the expectation of debt monetization in the U.S. Um, do you think there's merit to that? Yeah, I do. Okay. So when I, I think I think it's even worse than that. I think there is an outside chance hmm. that governments will expropriate assets. Okay. But um outside chance, but I think people are looking at it. I mean, I've had guys coming on on to me by email saying, I've got X, Y, and Z, where and how can I move it? I'm scared that the government is going to announce one day um, all your assets in the banks. I'm sorry, but they're no longer your assets. Okay. Do you, do you, where does the relation to... So that, that's a form of monetization of debt. Sure. Okay. What is the relation to the deficit spending that we were talking about earlier comes in? Do you think deficit spending is going to be good or bad for gold? Because, again, if, if we go back to whoever gets elected, if, well, in this case, if there is uh, an election, whoever gets elected, they're likely to promise more deficit spending and more um, more pain relief for the people, right? Um, which is why they would potentially get elected. So, how does deficit spending relate to gold? And if deficit spending is good for gold, go ahead. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Okay. I think the big buyers of gold that we've been seeing now will just increase their, their purchases. Mm. I think the trend, if you're looking at the next five-year trend, big money, big long-term money, will be out of paper assets and into real assets, whether it be land, property, or gold, mm. or food. Okay. You, I, I think you bring up a good point because it's not really, uh, sometimes people would look at it in isolation and say central banks have been buying a lot of gold. It seems like it's more, much more of a transition where their holdings of the U.S. dollars are going down and their holdings of the of, of gold are going up. So it's not just buying for a short period of time, it seems, but it seems no, like this, this could term. be... This is long term. How, how long? How long do you think it goes on for? It goes on whilst this stupid um, deficit spending globally goes on. Hmm. Whilst that goes on, they don't want paper. So it, it's it's something that, well, you're more or less making the case for a super cycle in gold prices, if you will. Yes, I am. Mm. One How way high? or another, gold is coming, first of all, is coming back into the monetary system. It's already there. I mean, for instance, just to give you one example, if I can give you two examples, Russia has a trade surplus with China. How is it being held? That surplus is being held through a gold differential account with the PBOC. Same thing between, I believe, same thing between Saudi Arabia and China. Hmm. So it's not being held in dollars. What does that do to gold gold prices long term? Where where do you see them? It's, it's underpinning it. Okay. It's the, it's, the, it's the early stages of gold coming back into the monetary system. It's replacing the dollar. 
the dollar having been the intermediary, now its goal is the intermediary. Hmm. It only underpins it on the downside, or does it also pull it to the upside? How far does it pull it? It's a stabilizing influence. I mean, nothing goes in a straight line. Of course. Of course. Okay. Well, but uh, I'm basically trying to get a number out of you. Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to give it to you because <laughs> I don't know. Okay. It can be any number. It could be 5,000. It could be 3,000. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I think it's much more important to understand the dynamic than guess a number. And absolutely. it'd be wrong. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I, I actually appreciate you not coming out swinging and saying 15,000 or something like that. What else, Simon? What, what kind of commodities are you, anything out of the ordinary? I mentioned uranium there last time you said you, you, you shared my bullish sentiment on it. What do you think about it right now, given how the world is developing? I think we need to watch very carefully. Um, China's new um, nuclear reactor policy, technological, technological change. And we need to watch very carefully whether Ukraine is successful or not in bombing the big um, nuclear power station in Ukraine, which is now under the ownership and has been since 2022 of Russia. There have been repeated attempts to hit the power station. They've failed so far, but if they were successful, the whole question of nuclear power safety be, will be reopened and that would probably cause um, corrections in uranium prices okay just the risk sure that's just always to be watched carefully i actually think that the shelling of zaporizhia has has done a, a good marketing job for uranium because it's been under constant fire and nothing yeah sure it hasn't been hit yet why is it not being hit? Because Russia's been there guarding it. <laughs> sure. Well, it's been hit. With, uh, there's been shelling, but uh, nothing, nothing really. No, that, nothing. That no, no direct hits. Got quite close just recently. Mm. Yeah. What? Uh, you you mentioned um, you know, food and energy in short supply. You mentioned at the beginning of our conversation here, and I'm going back to what Lynn Alden was saying there that you go long what's uh what's in short supply, um. And I know that you're quite the contrarian yourself, so coal jumps to mind first because it's down 35% year on year. And you say energy is in short supply. That almost inevitably means long coal. Are you long coal? I think, I think you should be long of all traditional forms of energy production. I think the CEO of Exxon really put it very simply in a short statement that he made at the APEC meeting in November. We invest in fossil fuels. We do not invest in renewables, but we invest in a technology that reduces emissions. That said, short sentence said it all. Sure. Mm. That's uh, based on what I've heard from other interviews that you've done. That, that agrees quite a lot with what you're saying. Um, and so naturally, again, I, I, I sort of classify you in my head as a contrarian. So I, I typically think, okay, maybe he's long lithium because lithium has halved in, in the last, um, well, year over year. It's down 50%. But then at the same time, I know you're not very bullish on where the entire electrical vehicle and, and renewable energy battery things are going. So I don't assume you're long lithium, are you? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. <laughs> okay, so nothing nothing else like... No, no, come on, look at what's going on in EVs. Huge pushback everywhere. Mm. Yeah, as it should. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. There's a reason for that. Consum okay. Consumers have just found that it's very costly to run and inconvenient. Mm. There's a couple of things that, given your sort of your worldview here of a war, um, complicating transport, but also complicating geopolitical relationships, rare earth elements is is pretty much the first thing that pops to mind in that case uh, as something that's easy to weaponize from the not west towards the west. Um, is there money to be made in that weaponization? I think when slowly they are weaponizing it slowly, slowly. Hmm. Just depends on what Washington specifically decides to do with China. I mean, Yellen's warning to to China: don't carry on selling to Russia goods and equipment that can be used for war, basically, put it simply. What is China's response? Mm. I'll be polite and say, get lost. Sure. What, what, else are you, what else are you bullish on besides gold, basically? Because that's the only thing. So energy, food, shelter, gold, that's basically the only thing that I'm getting out of you. Yeah, yeah. That sounds Hard assets, it. not paper. Fair, fair point. Um, I see that we've been talking for over an hour. I know that you must be tired of looking at my face and listening to my voice. What am I forgetting I'm to ask you? I've, I've got a report to get on to. <laughs> what am I forgetting to ask you, though? What what what, what else should we be talking about? No, here? I think you've covered everything. Thank you so much for investing your time with me, Simon. It is simon-hunt.com for people listening, wanting to read these reports and see what else Simon has to offer. But Simon, again, thank you for investing your time in me. Well, thank you for having me and good questions. Thank you very much.